I am going to talk a lot about um, what Anthony, Anthony talked to us about last week. So if you missed either or both of what he was speaking about, can I really encourage you? In fact, I can't encourage you highly enough to listen to um, both weeks um, again, if you've already heard them once, um, because you won't want to let those pass you by. Anthony finished off last, well, he, for most of the two weeks, he was asking these, as these two questions, victory for, from what and victory for what. And he finished off one of his final slides um, from, just click it, thank you, Gideon. One of his final slides was um, this quote, and it says, we're equipped, anointed, and commissioned to advance the kingdom until Jesus returns for his people. Um, if you got Anthony's slides through um, Hope Family, you will have seen that at the end. So therefore, and I usually find every time I read a therefore in the Bible, actually that means bearing in mind everything that's been said, what is our response going to be? And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to take that um, quote from Anthony and I'm going to say what does that actually mean for us what does that look like feel like and act like in our daily lives and uh, when I first moved to Scotland probably about 13 years ago and, and moved to Dundee I was um, went to a local school to teach uh, first time I'd ever taught in Scotland and I have to say I spent quite a few um, months actually learning some of the words that the children were saying to me because I actually had no idea what they were talking about. And one of the ones that really perplexed me so much at the beginning was when people would say to me, where do you stay? Because in England, we just ask people where they live. But, but I, constantly that would catch me out because I'd think, where do I stay? What does that mean? But actually, the more I heard that, the more that I realized that actually stay is so much more powerful word than live. Um, actually, it's, it's a bit of a TARDIS word, um, if you're a Doctor Who fan. Um, stay means to not move away from or leave a place or situation. To continue doing something. To live somewhere permanently. And in a more abstract way, it can be used, you know, it can be synonymous with to be alive, to breathe, to continue, to endure, to inhabit, to persist. It seems to involve a will and a decision, not just an accident. And Jesus, you know, uses a similar word in John 15, verse 4 to 5, about abiding. Ooh. And he, in, he says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, and neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And when I looked up, this is the, the educational bit, when I looked up um, what abide means in Greek, it actually means to stay in a given place. So added to that sense of being present and prevailing, we have that same idea of a will or a decision. So my title for today is Abiding in Victory or uh, This is not working, so I'm just going to keep going. Or where do you stay? Um, and I've got seven points today that I am going to go through quickly, but um, I want us to do a bit of self-diagnosis on ourselves. Now, I know those medical people among you will be thinking, oh, self-diagnosis is never a very good thing. <laughs> um, but actually, as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about when we lived in Newcastle, we lived actually not far from Hadrian's Wall. Um, and Hadrian's Wall, at, at this present time, lots of it is in ruins. But originally, Hadrian's Wall was a huge wall that stretched from coast to coast and along each of that stretch it wasn't just one long wall it had every mile it had a turret or a tower that was called a mile castle 
And so if you were a Roman soldier and you, were in, and you walked along, you were reminded every time of Rome's rule and dominion. And you could easily spot if you were still under Roman protection because there you were working, walking on the wall. The wall defended what had been won and it protect, protected from the dangers of the enemy. And I want us to look at these checkpoints. They're by no means exhaustive. And, but as, a, as an attempt to look at which kingdom do we live in and how do we continue to walk that victory? Now, there's not a, a, for me to, time to develop seven points, at which I'm sure you're going, few, otherwise we'll be here for ages. But what I want to do is to just give you some snapshots. And what I'm hoping that you're going to do is take some of those things away and you're going to dig into them yourself. Please listen to... We are nearing the end of our victory series, but go back and listen to all of them because all of them have the essence of what I'm talking about today. And also dig into the word, speak to people, and, and, and talk about how these seven points can affect your life. And you can think of loads more, and there are loads more, which is brilliant. Um, and add those to your personal list too. Um, because it's not exhaustive, just restricted by a little bit of time. But it's important that as we see these things, that we act on them and we don't just know about them. Abiding in victory is a lifestyle. It's done and it's cultivated often away from the crowd. It's a heart decision, and, it, and it's our heart decision that calls us into action. Um, next one, Gideon, please. Um, I've been listening to a new Bethel album called Victory, which I'm sure many of you have been. And the first song has this chorus. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. All that we're talking about is only possible because the king's alive. And I just want to leave you with a quote from Muhammad Ali before we start digging a little bit deeper. Muhammad Ali, very, very famous, celebrated boxer of our generation. And he said, the fight is won or lost far away from witnesses, behind the lines, in the gym, and out there on the road, long before I dance under those lights. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Some of this is internal heart stuff that overflows. So my first, first point is, the king is alive. Anthony talked loads about this last week. That the cross, yes, it gives us victory from sin, but it gives us victory for life because the cross ends in the resurrection of Jesus. Death was defeated and the king is alive. And Anthony just, just um, referenced this scripture that I just want to read a little bit more of this morning. And it's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 13 to 20. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, useless, amounting to nothing. And your faith is also vain, imaginary, unfounded, devoid of value and benefit, not based on truth. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and powerless, mere delusion. And you are still in your sins. If we who are abiding in Christ have hoped only in this life, and this is all there is, then we of all people most miserable are most miserable and to be pitied. But now... As things really are, Christ has in fact been raised. Incorruptible, immortal, foreshadowing the resurrection of those who have fallen asleep in death. That's 1 Corinthians 15 from the Amplified. We can live and abide because he is alive. Victory is won and we just get to stay in that place. And so in life's difficult and challenging circumstances, we cannot and it will never defeat his victory. Now, if you struggle to believe this, which I know most of us do, <laughs> or have done throughout our lives, 
then just pull out our Bibles. Look at the biblical foundation. Ask Jesus to make victory real to each one of us. Let it impact our hearts. And that will give you hope in every situation. So the king is alive. Number two, we need to know who we are and whose we are. Now, you can't have been, have been coming along to Hope Church um, very often without hearing about who you are in God. It's part of our foundational teaching that we know we're children of God. It's part of our foundational teaching that we have that um, certainty that the King is alive and he's alive in us and through us that we are children of God, chosen, redeemed, and belonging to God. We have been called to greatness to do the works of the kingdom. That's who I am. John 14 in the ESV says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And this is something I think traditionally um, in past years I've really struggled with, is I knew the king was alive, and that I knew with absolute certainty, but that I was a child of God and was co-heirs with Jesus. That was something that I really, really struggled with. I saw myself more as a servant than a son. And about eight years ago, I came along uh, with Ian to our inaugural, our first year of Hope School of Supernatural Life, knowing that I needed to know and I needed to understand something more of who I was in God, but having no idea how to do that. And I think I spent the first year listening to some amazing teaching, hearing some amazing testimonies of I was a child of God and therefore all the resources of heaven are mine I think it took me a year of listening to that before it dropped from here to here so I want to encourage you that if you like me struggle with that please I can't recommend HSSL highly enough and this week Hope Activate is starting as well, which again is perhaps a shorter time, but it actually will cement something in you of who God is, who you are, and why understanding that and letting that dwell in our hearts is so important. That experiencing this sonship doesn't rely on circumstances or emotions, or actually, if I want it to, but because of the victory of Jesus. I cannot live victoriously consistently unless I know who I am and that I share in Jesus' victory as a son, not as a servant. So I don't have time to unpack that more, but please can I encourage you, if that is something you think, oh, I'm not really sure, I really get that, let me recommend HSSL and Hope Activate to you where they'll give you a greater depth of understanding and, a greater, and, and, and more time than I have to explain it to you. In the Passion Translation, Romans 8 says, But you have received the spirit of full acceptance, enfolding you into the family of God. And you will never feel orphaned, for as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, Beloved Father, for the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, You are God's beloved child. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures. For indeed, we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him. Amen. Now I can know the king is alive and I can know who I am. But actually, my third point is, I still have a choice um, to walk daily in the victory or not. Um, God doesn't compel us to walk victoriously. He invites us to do that. I have a choice. I can just have the odd moment when I 
sense God's presence and I know he's with me. Or I can constantly walk that way. I can have a conviction of victory in him and who he's called me to be. But there's a choice involved to believe his promises, being an overcomer and the provision of heaven. Now circumstances, and it happens for all of us to to some degree or other, circumstances are often hard and challenging. And it's in that hard and challenging time that we make a choice. We can have a bit of the dad's army approach. Don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. But actually, it isn't about not panicking. It's just about believing. And even the most difficult circumstances, there is nothing outside the victory that Jesus won for us on the cross. Choice is a bit like faith, really. We choose to lay hold of what we do not yet see in the here and now. But our choice is to look um, steadfastly um, to Jesus. There's a wonderful bit again from the Passion where it talks about Abraham. Abraham is a great example to us of things that didn't go very well for a long time. But it says here, against all odds when it looked hopeless, Abraham believed the promise and expected God to fulfill it. He took God at his word, and as a result, he became the father of many nations. God's declaration over him came to pass. Your descendants will be so many that they will be impossible to count. In spite of being nearly 100 100 years old, and the fact that he and Sarah were incapable of conceiving a child, he never stopped believing God's promise. He was made strong in his faith to father a child. And because he was mighty in faith and convinced that God had all the power needed to fulfill his promises, Abraham glorified God. So I just want to encourage us to keep making those choices. Um, and just We read an amazing testimony, if you were here last week, from Lydia Gakonde about the financial provision that God had opened up to her. She prayed long and hard, and if you get a chance to talk to Lydia more fully um, later on, she prayed long and hard, and she kept making that choice and that decision to choose to believe God's provision and to choose to focus on that, and she was not disappointed. And God will never disappoint us if our focus remains on him. Number four, joy. A good one. And I know because I've said it myself, how can I be joyful when this has just happened? How can I be joyful when I look at my family, when I look at my finances, when I look at my health? How can I be joyful? But you know, joy is not about our emotions. It's not about our events, and it's not just that we were made that way with a smile on our face. Joy is not happiness. It's, nor is it an emotion at all, but it's a fundamental position of faith that we stand in, which can then overflow into our emotions. It doesn't, it, joyful people smile, they laugh, they are um, refuse to get bogged down, but it doesn't start there. It starts in a def- decision of heart. And Sam Storms, who's an American theologian, says, joy is not necessarily the absence of suffering. It's the presence of God. And C.S. Lewis, famous author, joy is the serious business of heaven. Galatians 5 calls joy one of the fruits of Holy Spirit life within us. It's not just a goal, but it's actually evidence that the Holy Spirit is within us. 1 Peter 1 verse 8 says, Our joy is in him. Philippians 4, Be cheerful with joyous celebration in every season of life. Let joy overflow, for you are united with the Anointed One. John 16 verse 24, Ask so that your joy may be full and complete. And 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice always and delight in your faith. Right at the beginning of our our, um, series on victory, Andy Merrick preached about Jesus and the joy set before him. The joy set before him, he endured the cross. 
Sometimes our joy is set before us. Sometimes we have to reach forward and grab some of that joyful certainty of the victory of Jesus and we have to pull it back into our present. Do you know, Nehemiah, one of the famous verses we always quote, you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Um, When Nehemiah talked about that, he was sitting in a city of ruins. He, with conflict and opposition all around him, but he knew what God's promises were to him. Having that certainty of joy makes a difference. It works from the inside out. I am, um, I'm a great, not a great, but I quite enjoy watching sport on television, particularly football or tennis. Um, and so I can quite happily sit and watch a football match or a tennis match. If I'm a neutral, I can quite happily watch it quite peaceful as I watch it. If it has to do with a team that I support or a player that I support, I am a totally different person. Ian will testify to this. I shout. I know you find this difficult to hear, but I shout at the television. I quickly lose any hope of victory if things don't seem to be going the right way. I quickly get discouraged. Actually, and I know there's going to be shock and horror I prefer to record it, find out the score, and then watch it. Now, I know for some people that is absolute sacrilege, but I prefer to do that. I feel much calmer, and so I know when I'm watching my football team, who I am not going to open myself to ridicule and tell you who, um, I know that if there's 10 minutes to go and they're 4-0 down, I know that they still win. And joy is a bit like that. That's a bit of a silly example, but joy is a bit like that. Once you know the end, Paul talks about these these present difficulties are pointing us to future glory. And that's what joy is like. When you know the end, it makes a difference. Even in the midst of really difficult times, actually, knowing the end makes a difference. And that's what joy is. Joy knows the end. Joy knows that it'll all work out for good because we love God. Joy doesn't let the difficulties of the present time rob us of the certainty of God's promises. Again, Romans 8 in the Passion. If you, if you never read the Passion translation, and I also recommend that as a bit of an aside. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. We are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his divine purpose. Number five, courage. Gideon, you are doing a fantastic job. Maybe I'm not as technically minded as I think I am. (laughs) Courage. I had the privilege of talking about courage to the women of hope. Um, a couple of months ago. And uh, what, I, what I discovered as I was thinking about courage, that often we have the impression that courage is an act, that courage is a doing something, that they are, they're courageous acts, that we're only courageous when we produce something. But actually, courage is the act itself. Courage becomes about being something rather than doing something. Courage is about a stand we take in our hearts. It's not about what's out there. What's out there comes from what's in here. And when I looked up the Latin word for courage is core, and lots of European languages will have that as part of the the stem of like, in French, it's curb. And actually, it originally started to mean to speak out all that's in your heart. That was the original Latin meaning. And then it began to mean valor and a quality of mind which enables you to meet danger without fear. And then as the centuries get on, the words for heart and the words for courage became metaphors for inner strength. And so being courageous is not doing courageous. It's a lifestyle, not an event. And it actually begins to look a lot like faith 
and perseverance, a steadfast belief in a good father. Courage is actually working on the inner stuff. A lot of what I'm talking about this morning is working on the inner stuff. It doesn't come from the outside in, it comes from the inside out. Nobody can make me courageous. I can only be courageous and take risks because I trust in the victory of Jesus and it it comes out of me. Nelson Mandela, again, a very famous figure in um, the, the 20th century, said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear but triumph over it. So let's embrace courage, believing firmly and totally that we can walk in the daily victory of Jesus. And then that attitude of heart will spill over into the visible. Courageous thoughts, courageous posture will spill over into courageous acts. And those courageous acts will be seen. Again, it's a bit of a sporting thing this morning, but there's a great quote I I just love great quotes. Those people who know me well know I'm always coming out with them. Again, a very famous boxer who said, champions don't become champions in the ring. They are merely recognized there. And that a bit sums up what I'm talking about this morning, that it's not all out there, what I have on show. It's what happens within me. Courage is cultivated in the quiet places, the refusing to accept less than God's best places the overcoming challenge places and the difficult places. It refuses to let go of God and his promises. Courage on the inside feeds courage on the outside. If you want to be a risk taker for Jesus, if you, want to, if you look at other people and say, oh, they're so brave, actually start cultivating courage in your hearts by believing God. Number six, this one I don't like at all. Perseverance and patience. <laughs> not, I am not a great fan of that. Um, and generally, I am not a very patient person. Um, I like things to happen quickly. And this is one of, the, this is one of these, these mile castles I'm working on at the minute. Do you know, we can all be clothed, enjoy courage, know the king is alive, um, know whose we are, and we can choose, and we can still walk round the corner and run slap bang into the brick wall of circumstances. The circumstances and the difficulties of life. This tries us, not like a pass or fail, <clears throat> but Paul talks it more about purifying metal that actually removes, even though we might not like perseverance and patience, it does remove the impurities and is good for us. The Bible If you don't think that's true, get out your Bible and look up troubles, perseverance, and patience. In Galatians 5, in the Amplified, and I just love this, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the result of his presence within us is love, unseen concern, unselfish concern for others, joy, that's inner peace, patience, not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting. Kindness, goodness and faithfulness do you know there's a song that we sometimes like to sing and it says even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death your perfect love is casting out fear and even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back I know you are near and I will fear no evil for my God is with me and if my God is with me who then shall I fear Who then shall I fear? Perseverance is a process of moving towards all God has for us. Romans 5, and the message says, there's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know that troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we're never feeling shortchanged, quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through his Holy Spirit. So if, if, and I think most of us, if we're honest, are in this phase, probably 90% of our time, um, in believing God for something that we don't, 
yet see happen, which is why we get so excited about testimony, because it's those breakthroughs that, that give us who are waiting that knowledge that God is on the move. Um, something we're believing for. Be convinced, be convicted that you are showcasing God's goodness and his pleasure in you. Again, faith and patience and perseverance reaches forward sometimes and pulls something from what we do not see, we do not yet see, and pulls it into our present and gives us that certainty that actually the goodness of God is working. And number seven. And whilst I was preparing these, I, I and preparing the first six points, um, I felt God speaking to me all the time about me. Um, but in number seven, the, on our last point, I, want, I felt as, as I was preparing it that Holy Spirit was saying, actually, this is not just for me, and actually not just for individuals, but it's actually for us as a church family, and that's one anothering. And um, I just felt a sense of weight out prepared this, that actually it's, it's a really important victory principle for us as a community. Do you know we are called to, and you'll see them all up there, love one another, get along with one another, encourage one another, show hospitality to one another, outdo one another in showing honor, be kind to one another, forgive one another, build up one another, Submit to one another, comfort one another, bear with one another, stir one another to love and good works, etc., etc., etc. They were but a few. The New Testament is full of one anothering. Do you know, Paul in Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God, and it'll be a passage that probably, if we went through Sunday school, will be so familiar to us. And Paul used a model that he knew, which was the model of a Roman soldier. And a template, actually, from the most victorious and successful, arm, and successful army of the day. He actually was using what he saw in front of him. The Roman army was an elite fighting force. But he, as he talked about putting on the full armor of God, he would never, ever have thought about that soldier on their own going out and standing in a field of battle he, would, he always thought about them as part of an army. And um, having spent a lot of time in Newcastle, I, uh, I got used to the Geordies, the Geordie U's. U's will do it, meaning everybody, not just one U, but lots of U's. Um, and it's plural. When Paul, I'm going to read out that whole section. But Paul talks about, you know, we stand, you stand, we stand not against flesh and blood. He's talking about us as a community. He's talking about plural, not individual. Yes, there is a responsibility, I think, to put our own armor on. And, but we stand together as an army. And this is how the Roman army fought. Part of the victory is standing with others. I like to think, I can't prove from history, but I like to think every soldier had their, their part in that. Everyone had their own place. Because actually, they had to do battle formation pretty quickly. They marched in one formation and then suddenly into battle formation. So it's quite likely that they would have had the same people either side of them. How are we doing with that? Who stands around you with their shields overlapped like that? I think women do this more intuitively. I think women do like to talk more and, and be vulnerable more. So when I was, I was thinking about this, I just felt God wants to particularly ask this of the men in our church family. Who one another's you and who do you one another? Advancing the kingdom is a community as well as an individual responsibility. Um, about five weeks ago, Ian and I became grandparents for the sixth time, our second little grandson. And uh, way, way back, probably about 18 months ago, God really spoke to me about um, that 
we would have another grandson. Um, our youngest daughter had great difficulty conceiving um, and there's been a bit of a trauma about um, our grandson's birth as well. But actually, what really sustained me through that 18 months was I had three wonderful friends who overlapped their shields with me and for Mary Lou and for Jan and for Teresa, they prayed with me. They were at the end of a WhatsApp message. They asked how things were going. They were my constant support in all that time when there were so many opportunities to doubt what God was doing. There were so many opportunities medically that actually we would end up with a healthy grandson at all. So I just want to say we cannot survive without some overlap overlap shields. We are too exposed. It's very difficult to be on your own as a soldier fighting everything that's coming at you, which is what our church family is about. Now, some of you will be sitting here and you'll be thinking, yeah, I know who mine are, because names have already come to you. They're my friends. They're people that will stand with me. Um, those are the people I get to be me with. But actually, some of, some of us find this difficulty for lots of different variety of reasons not necessarily our own reluctance to do this. Can I encourage you to start where you are with faith, perseverance, courage, and joy? I I just want to honor Lydia. I know I read her her, um, testimony out last week. But Lydia and I didn't always know each other as well as we do now. And I think it was probably about a year ago or 18 months ago, I remember just coming in on a Sunday morning, seeing Lydia there and saying hi. And in our conversation, I I can't even remember the question I asked. Maybe it was, how are you? Maybe it's, what what, what you believe in God for? Just a simple question. And she shared with me then about the, the financial difficulties that were making life really difficult for her. And so I said, right, okay, let's pray. I want to pray for you. So I prayed for her, went away. Maybe two or three weeks later, a month later, caught sight of her again. How's that going? Have you seen the provision of God yet? No. Let's pray again. So we prayed and we chatted about other things, didn't we, Lydia? About how each of us was doing. It wasn't a one-way conversation but I would come back three or four months later. How's it going? Has God come through on that? Can I stand with you again? And so we've done that for about a year until about three weeks ago, Lydia. And Lydia runs up to me, throws her arms around you and says exactly what I testified, what her testimony was last week. God is amazing. Isn't that wonderful? Because I get to share in that joy with her. And that's what one anothering is all about. So can I, we get time at the end of a meeting. Ask over coffee. How are you? Do you know, sometimes nobody, we can come in and out on a Sunday morning and nobody actually asks us how we are. So ask somebody, how are you? Is there anything I can pray for you this week? You'll be surprised the difficulties and the challenges that people face even in the week ahead. Share testimonies of God's goodness. If you're speaking to somebody and they say, I don't don't have any, I don't have any money to last the week. Okay, I believe God can do it. I go and find Lydia because she knows God can do it. And you pray, you speak words of encouragement and hope and joy and courage over that person. Be deliberate. This will not happen by accident. You cannot one another yourself by accident. We are wired to think of ourselves first. But actually, we have to make a a deliberate effort to think of others more than ourselves. Um, Those Roman soldiers spent their lives together. 
They were round campfires. They were marching together. They were doing all, all the things. So that in times of challenge and difficulty, they could rely on one another. And actually, that's what our community, our church family should be. So let's build a victorious community together, which cheers us on into victory. I just want to, again, just finish off by sharing a testimony of my watching football days again. It's a bit of a football uh, theme this morning. But um, when I was younger, um, at, at secondary school, I used to go along and watch my um, local team, which was Leeds United. So as the Yorkshire people would say, I was now but a lass as I went along. And I would watch them every week. And you can tell how long ago that is because it was standing. It wasn't all seats at that time. And then there came a time, the team is more successful then than it is now, I have to say. But it came a time when we were in the equivalent of what we would be the Champions League semi-final today. And uh, I managed to get a ticket and went along. And I, I, we were standing. And I, actually, I've never, ever been anywhere that was so squashed. There was just people everywhere. You had people the side of you, people in the front, people in the back. And everybody was watching this football match, which we won, and rejoicing. And there was a, a, a definite community of we're all going for the same thing. We're all here for the same reason. And... At some point in that whole match, I took my feet off the floor and never moved because I was so hemmed in by other people. And you know, that was what community is about. Sometimes we can be all rejoicing and victorious and going for the same thing. Sometimes we need to take our feet off the floor. And actually, there has to be a support that keeps us and, and takes care of us and enables us to have enough energy to put our feet back down again. So, I want us just to make a response. I love it when Anthony Hilda preaches because he always says he wants a response. What are we going to do with what we've heard? Which is great because sometimes it can go in one ear and out the other. So, what I would do is I'd like us to stand, please. And what I, I've written on here... The next slide, thank you, Gideon. All those seven points. So I want you to look at them, please. And I want you to ask Holy Spirit, which one, two, five, seven of those are you speaking to me about this morning? What do you want me to listen to? What do you want me to change about my mindset in that area? Am I determined to stay and abide in victorious living as a child of God? What am I going to do differently with what you're telling me? What adjustments will I have to make in my life to do that? Can we pursue that victory for what question that Anthony reminded us of? Do we actually believe we're equipped, anointed, commissioned to advance the kingdom? until Jesus returns for his people? Are we actually abiding and staying in that place of victory? just want to give you a few minutes just to ask Holy Spirit what he's speaking to you this morning. And then when he's spoken something to you, can you ask him how he, how he wants you to do that? How he wants you to do that. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we just thank you for your amazing wisdom. We thank you for the victory that we get to stand in freely. We thank you for the victory of the cross and the victory of the resurrection. We thank you that you want us to abide, to stay in that place in every moment, 
circumstance of our lives. And we thank you that you've already provided all that we need to do just that. So we thank you, Jesus, for your wisdom. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you've spoken to us this morning. And we pray that as we take that and let that knowledge drop from head to heart, that we will continue and increase in our abiding. We will increase in our staying in your presence in all circumstances, good or bad, happy or sad, that we will be the joyful people that you want us to be. Thank you, Jesus.